The first day of Holy Week is known as Palm Sunday. And uh, the, the reason why it's called Palm Sunday is uh, the Sunday before Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified on Friday. The Sunday before Jesus was crucified, Jesus rode on a donkey through the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And we read in Luke chapter 19, if you want to go there later and take a look at that, as Jesus rode through the gates of Jerusalem, he was hailed as king by the multitude who also extended their cloaks on the road as he rode over their cloaks and they greeted him with palm branches. And as they greeted him with palm branches, they also yelled out, Hosanna. And sometimes we sing a song where we're proclaiming Hosanna, and some of you don't know what Hosanna is. That's okay. It's, a, it's an Aramaic word that means God save us now. Now, what's interesting is that same crowd that lay down their cloaks for Jesus to ride over, the same crowd that greeted Jesus with palm branches and shouted out, Hosanna, God save us now, as Jesus rode through the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, in less than a week, they were now raising their fists to heaven and asking for Jesus' crucifixion. They were now asking for Jesus' execution. Why did their minds change so fast? Not even a week. They're, they're, they're hailing him as king, and now they are crying out for his death and execution. And, and the reason for that is because uh, Jesus did not come to meet their expectations of a kingdom. Look at this. I have a picture here of Jesus' triumphal entry over the city of Jerusalem. This is the crowd. Uh, they, 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 they expected Jesus to establish a kingdom just like the old kingdoms that they were used to, a kingdom that was characterized by power and military might. They expected Jesus to come in and overthrow the occupiers, uh, occupiers who were the Romans at the time. Uh, they expected Jesus to establish a kingdom like all the other kingdoms that they were used to. And yet Jesus had come to inaugurate a new kingdom. Jesus came to inaugurate a better kingdom that they had no idea about. And so in the course of that week, when they began to observe Jesus' interaction with the religious class and authority and what Jesus did at the temple and the teachings that Jesus taught and that last week, they said, he is not for sure bringing the kingdom that we expect, and so we don't want this king anymore. They failed to see the value and the worth of the new kingdom of Jesus, uh, the kingdom that Jesus has come to establish. Uh, no kingdom can be built in its likeness. It's a far better kingdom, and he invites you and I to join that kingdom. He invites us to be a participant of the kingdom that he has come to establish. And so in a day like today, it's important for us to revisit this idea. And it also falls in line with this series of sermons that we're preaching in the book of Galatians, this letter that the apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia. Because Paul's frustration here as he writes this letter to the church in Galatia is because they had entered that kingdom. They had tended to Jesus' invitation to be a part of this kingdom, but they were now going back to the old ways, to the old kingdom. And Paul's saying, why would you enter this new kingdom, this better kingdom, and now want to go back to the old ways, to the old kingdom? It reminds me of the story of uh, the people of Israel's delivery from Egypt. Uh, you know God used Moses to deliver the people of Israel that were in captivity in Egypt for 400 years. And after, shortly after they were delivered, after they crossed the Red Sea, in fact, after God parted the waters of the Red Sea and they were on the other side and destroyed their enemies and, and gave them and granted them freedom, you know, the people started coming back to Moses and saying, I want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> and Moses, what? <laughs> yeah, I want to go back to Egypt because the food there was better than the food here in the desert. Why would... You, after experiencing freedom, want to go back to slavery. That's the issue that Paul is facing here in Galatians. 
And that's the issue of our lives as well. Many of us have come into the kingdom of Christ, but we're resorting to the old ways of the old kingdom. And it's time for us to be, re be reminded of what this kingdom is about. And so I want to invite you to read with me from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29, uh, where Paul reminds us of the difference between the old kingdom and the new, and why the new is infinitely better than the old. This is what he writes in verse 23. Now before faith came, underline that, now before faith came, there's a, a before and an after. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. This is the word of the Lord. As we talk about uh, the kingdom that Jesus has come to establish, I want us to uh, contrast his kingdom with the other kingdoms of the world. And, and let's talk about why his kingdom is different. Uh, let's talk about why his kingdom is better. And, and then lastly, uh, we'll talk about the fact that his kingdom is open. It's open to all, right? Uh, so first, uh, his kingdom is different than all the other kingdoms of this world. Why is it different? Uh, if you were paying attention to the reading of the text, verses 23 through 29, uh, Paul is contrasting here faith versus the law. He's contrasting the law and faith. They're two different things that must not be confused. And therefore, if you go to verse 23, look, look at what he says about the contrast between faith and law. First was what? First was law or first was faith? First was law. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. So before faith came, there was the law. The law was the old kingdom, the law was the previous administration, but now that administration has passed with the coming of the new. In fact, that's the title of the sermon. The new is here. There's a new administration in place. And what he seems to teach us about this new kingdom, this new administration that is in place, that has replaced the law, is faith who he compares to Christ. Look, verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. It's interesting here in this passage, and I want you to pay attention to this. This is very, very important. It's foundational for the sermon today, that Paul is using faith and Christ interchangeably because he is focusing on faith not as an immaterial thing, but he's focusing on the object of our faith, which is Jesus. Our faith has no worth and has no value if it's aimed at nothing. Our faith only has worth and value because it's aimed at a person, because it has an object. The power of our faith is the object of our faith, which is Christ. And so he's using faith and Christ interchangeably, uh, so much so that as you uh, continue to read in verse 25, says, now, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. So he is, he is talking about the fact that because of faith, now we have Jesus. Faith and Jesus are the, the new kingdom, the new administration. It's dangerous, however, for us to look at this contrast of the old kingdom, the old administration of the law, and the new one, which is Jesus' kingdom, by which we enter through faith, and look at what was previously established as something bad. It's true that uh, Christians do not follow the law, they follow the person of Jesus. Uh, we are not bound to the law, we're bound through love, by love, 
to Jesus, that's who we follow. We follow a person. We don't follow a set of rules. We don't follow a set of principles. And it is dangerous for us to look at that and say, well, the law is bad because now all that matters is Jesus. And what I want you to understand is that the law is not bad in itself. The law is good because of two reasons. First, the law. I don't know if you knew about this, but when we talk about the law, we're talking about the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. The law is the reflection of the character of God. It's like a mirror that shows us God's character. You want to know the quality of the character of the God that we worship and we serve, look at the law. He does not commit adultery. He does not steal. He does not lie. He does not murder. He is fully satisfied within himself. He does not covet. The law is a mirror that reflects the character of God to us. We cannot see God face to face, but the law shows us sort of like the face of God. So the law is important for that reason. And the other thing that the Apostle Paul teaches us here and he reminds us is that the law has functioned to us as a guardian, meaning until we are of age, we are under the law. Let me give you the illustration that the Apostle Paul is giving them. It's like movies that you've watched before, right? You have a king, and the king has a successor. And sometimes when the king dies and the successor is not at age, what is he given? He is given a guardian until he is mature enough to take over his father's throne. It's like a minor. The parents die and leave an inheritance. They cannot be given hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars just yet because they're too young. They don't know how to use that money. They're, it's going to be taken from them. Somebody's going to take advantage. It's going to rob them. So you have to have a guardian until they become of age to be able to manage that money. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is before Christ came, before this kingdom, this new administration was established, we were already in God's will, but we were under the tutorship of the law. The law was preparing us for what would come. The law in itself is incomplete to save us. We needed what was going to come after the law. It was foundational for what would come. It's kind of like, uh, let me give you an illustration here. It's kind of like uh, the, invent the invention of papyrus, right? When they invented papyrus, it was revolutionary because you could record ideas and reproduce ideas and share ideas. When they invented papyrus in Egypt. You, you heard that in geography class, right, or, or history class. And then in the 1500s, they invented the printed press. Is papyrus more effective than the printing press? No, because the scale by which you are able to record ideas and diffuse and, and, and distribute ideas with the printing press uh, was far more efficient than papyrus. You had to copy you know, manuscript by manuscript. Now you can just print it. But had you not had the papyrus, you would not have the printing press. You understand what I'm saying? If there was no paper, how could you have the printing press? It was necessary for what would come later. And what he's saying is the law was necessary for what would come later because had Christ come without the context of the law, we would not know how sinful we are. We would not know how much we need God. How much we need a savior. Because the law is unattainable. That's the second thing about the law. It's unattainable. None of us, because we're sinners, are able, even if we try hard, to fulfill the law of God. As a matter of fact, I'd like to suggest that based on Jesus' interpretation of how we relate to the law in the Sermon on the Mount, we're breaking the law every day. You may not, you may not lie to somebody, you may not sleep with someone else's spouse, but Jesus says, if you look with an impure eye to anyone who's not your spouse, you already committed adultery. <laughs> the intention is more important. And therefore, we sin every day, all the time. Chances are, before you walked into church today, you already sinned. You're sitting here, you're having thoughts, you're already sinning. <laughs> We're sinful people. The law is unattainable. No one can attain salvation through full obedience to the law. So while the law is good, Jesus is better, and while the law is unattainable, Jesus comes in a contrast, contrast in this new 
a kingdom that he's come to establish to fulfill the law for us. So he has come to fulfill the law for us. And and that's why, uh, you know, in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, we read this. Romans 10, chapter 4. Next verse, please. We read this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Jesus in Matthew 5 says this, for I did not, don't think that I have come to abolish the law for the, or the prophets. I have, come to abo- not, I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. And so there's two ways for you to live. If you live under the old administration, you're still under the pressure to prove yourself by obedience to the law, or you can take God's solution, which is someone that has fulfilled the law on your behalf, what is it going to be? We also see that the law is impersonal. The law shows no favoritism. If you, you can't go and when you break the law, like the speeding law, for instance, and you say, hey, listen, I'm sorry, but I just went five miles over. I try to do that all the time when I'm stopped by the cops. And the interesting thing is this, is that a cop could just say, no, the law is 30 miles an hour is the speed limit. I don't care if you were doing 32, 31. He has the law backing him because the law shows no partiality. The law is the law. It's not a person. And so I have to plead with the guy, but please, man, like I pay my taxes, and next time you come to my driveway, I'll, I'll give you a cup of coffee or go to my church's parking lot. You can hang out there with all your buddies and eat donuts all day. It's fine. Like, we're good, right? So you're pleading because... There's something different when you're relating to a person. You know, if you follow a system, it's dry and it's stiff. But if you're following a person, it's personal, it's different. You know, religion is about following a set of principles and rules. There's no flexibility there, but Christianity comes and shows that the new kingdom that has come and and is dwelling among us is one that's personal. It's led by a person, it's led by a king, and so we follow a king not a set of rules. The other contrast is this, is that the law is always unforgiving. Any set of laws that you conform yourself to is going to be unforgiving when you break it, when you fail it. Let's say if you, uh, let me give you an example, and we're all, we're all, we all experience this on a constant basis. Uh, There's laws of performance in our society, especially when it comes to work. If you, if you live your life to fulfill the expectations of a specific industry that you work under and you fail it, it will crush you, it will destroy you. And you're going to spend your life unable to forgive yourself because of the mistakes you're committed. Why? Because your work or the system there, that system is not equipped to forgive you of your sins. It can't forgive you of your sins. If you live for the law of approval of your children and you end up failing, you'll hate yourself for the rest of your life because that system, it will be unforgiving towards you. But the good thing about Jesus that the apostle Paul is saying here and reminding them of the new reality that they are now under is that if you sin, if you fail the law, you have a savior that not only has fulfilled the law for you, but is able to forgive you when you fail. You know, the interesting thing to me is that there's so many people that come in through the doors of our churches every week, and every church, as a matter of fact, that have no idea about this reality. They call themselves followers of Jesus while living under a system of law. They haven't been truly delivered because that they don't know any better. They're not taught any better. And maybe you're here today, but I want you to see the worth and the value of what it means to live under the dispensation, under the administration, under the reality of a king such as Jesus. So that you never return to the old kingdom. So you never flirt with the old ways. So that you never subject yourself to any other system of rules except for the love of Jesus that has been ushered into you through his work on the cross. You can begin to see right now that not only is his kingdom different, but his kingdom 
is better. Why? Because it comes, his kingdom comes with full rights. Look at verse 26 again. Go back to verse 26. The apostle Paul says this, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now, the first time I read this many years ago, this was always very puzzling to me, and especially if you are a woman and you read passages and verses like this in the Bible, that's got to you know, bother you at some level because we know that Paul is writing to both men and women at the time. And why does he say that in Christ you are all sons of God? Doesn't, is he not gender sensitive, the apostle Paul here? <laughs> is, he, is he a machista? Is that, is that what, what, what we get from a verse like this? And I, I want to say to you, especially women, um, by no means he is not. In fact, this, this verse to the people that read it for the first time when Paul wrote this, this was extremely liberating, especially towards the women. Because you've got to understand this, that back in those days in that culture, the only person that had the rights to all of the estate of the father was the oldest son. The oldest son was the one that uh, was entitled to everything. And you know what Paul is saying here? Saying this, if you are in Christ, regardless of who you are, regardless of your gender, regardless of anything, of your race, regardless, you are counted as a co-heir with Christ. It's all yours. Everything that is Christ's is yours. This kingdom comes with full rights. Look, in every group in society, for you to be in a position of respect and power, you have to work your way up, right? Like even if you become an American citizen, you don't come in as a politician. <laughs> you got to work your way up. You, when you come into this country as a citizen, you don't even have a credit score. You can't even buy stuff. You got to work your way up. If you join, if you join any club, you got to work your way up. Whatever club that is, you got to work your way up in any group in society. You got to work your way up through your performance. But in the kingdom, you come right at the top. Why do you come right at the top? Because you come as a child of God. And all that is Christ is yours. That's how you come in. There's no kingdom on earth like that. Where you come right at the top as a child has full access to the Father. You know, kids have a special place in the Father's heart. My kids do. I'll tell you this much. They have full access to me. They can interrupt me anytime. I'll, I'll. In fact, when a, at the other campus, when the service is over, they all come to me and they're giving me their, their Stanleys and they take off their shoes and they expect me to hold everything while they're playing. They interrupt my conversations. And I have to say, guys, I'm having a serious conversation with somebody. They do that all the time. They can interrupt me at night. Look, if my wife comes to me at night and says, hey, honey, uh, if, she's, if she's well in, in health, okay, if she's well in health, if she says, uh, can you grab me a cup of water? I said, no, you have two legs. We should go back. Go to the kitchen yourself and get yourself a cup of water. I, I, sorry, sorry. I, you do the same. You, I know you. I mean, if she's sick, obviously, I mean, I'll, I'll bend myself backwards for her. But if she's okay, I'm like, look, girl, you, 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 do it. you were doing squats the other day. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, if, but if my six-year-old comes to daddy, I need a cup of water. I'm getting out of bed. I'm getting out of bed because they have full rights. And that's who you have become in Jesus. All that's Christ is yours. Intimacy. The intimacy with the Father is yours. You don't have to bargain for intimacy with God. You don't have to purchase intimacy with God. You know, think about this. In this culture, we spend so much money in, on intimacy. We're in pursuit of intimacy. Some of you are like logged into Tinder the whole time. <laughs> don't, no, yo, don't act like you don't do that. And some of you are spending money on books and seminars and counseling so that you can have intimacy in your relationships. And it's never perfect, but the intimacy that you're looking for that's available to you through God, your Father, is available because of Jesus. It's yours. The same approval and love that Jesus shares with, with the Father, it's, it's, it's made available to us. There are many benefits, like eternity. Like we live in a culture that's afraid of death. We're spending money and more money trying to extend human life. I was listening to this podcast the other day. The guy was saying that 
in the next 20 years, people will be normal to see people living up to 120, 130 years. There's so much advance happening in, in technology and medicine because we're obsessed with the eternal. And Jesus says, you don't need none of that. You don't need none of the research, none of the money. It, I can give you eternal life. You can live forever if you embrace the new, my new kingdom. It's yours. And it's for all. It's for all. You know, there's certain groups in society, any group that you're joining, you have to meet some requirements and some qualifications, right? There's some race qualifications. There are some gender qualifications, some groups. There are education qualifications. Uh, there are professional qualifications. You gotta submit a resume anytime you're joining a club. If you, if you wanna join the yacht club here, you gotta apply. And they're gonna look at your everything and decide whether you're worthy of that club or not. And that happens in any club in life. You have, there's some qualifications that you had to meet. Some people without the qualifications can't join, sorry. You can't get the job. You can't become a citizen. You can't. And with Jesus, the most encouraging thing that we read here in verse 28 is this, is that in him there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male or female. You're all one in Jesus Christ. All the qualifications have been met, not because of what you have and what you have done, of what you accumulated, but because of Jesus has done for you. It's his qualification that counts on your behalf. In Jesus, any outsider can become an insider. And you thought that you were being kept out because of some of the things that you've done or, or the person that you are. That's not what the gospel says. What the gospel says, if you come in Jesus, you are welcomed in. So why would you want to stay in the old administration? Why would you want to stay in this old kingdom? Why would you want to return to this old administration and this old kingdom? Why not embrace the new? You must learn this, that his kingdom is open. This is the third point. His kingdom has no borders. The only documentation for you to enter his kingdom, the passport, has to read Jesus. Through Jesus, you can come. Through Jesus, you can come. If you learn what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in verse 27, which is to put on Christ, look at what he says in verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know what the invitation here for us is? Which I think it's very interesting with what happened on the triumphal entry. What were the people doing first as Jesus was riding through the gates of the city? They were taking off their clothes and they were laying on the floor, on the ground, so that Jesus could ride through and over. And in many ways, this is what he's inviting us to do. He's inviting you to take your old clothes, your old clothes. And I, I'm not saying like your literal old clothes. <laughs> You know what I mean, right? What you use to cover yourself, because some of you cover yourself with your work, some of you cover yourself with your physical appearance, some of you cover yourself with your parenting, some of you cover yourself with your race. Jesus is saying, take off those old clothes and put them before me at my feet, and I will ride over them, and if you do that, I will give you new clothes. I will give you royal clothes that will make you presentable anywhere you go because you are wearing what I wear. You're exchanging your righteousness for the righteousness of Christ. That's the idea here. He's inviting all of you to do that. He said, everything that you've put on this far doesn't count. It's not enough. I have better clothes for you. Take it off and I'll give it to you. Will you put on Christ today? Will you do that? Well, you're saying like, well, how do I put on Christ? He says it's through faith. Verse 29, and if you are Christ, this is the last verse. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You come through faith. That's how you put on Christ. It's through faith. What makes you a person who is a partaker of the kingdom, what makes you a part of God's people is not or no longer what the old administration say. It's not your race and and, and, it, and it's not your obedience to the law. A lot of people still think that God's special people is Israel. It's not. He says here, the DNA that Abraham passed on, 
the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would have a great nation has nothing to do with the race. It's the faith that counts. Because he says in the previous chapter, Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so the seed of Abraham that passes on to us and brings us into the kingdom of God is faith in Jesus. When we're able to truly believe that the clothes that he offers us is better than the ones we have sewed for ourselves and we have clothed ourselves with. And so today, don't do like the multitude that had the expectation that Jesus would give them a kingdom that he did not come to offer. Oh, today, don't be like the Galatians who were living under this new administration, this new kingdom, but were wanting to return to this old one. Today, lift up your eyes and your head and see Jesus as king and hail him as king and shout out, Hosanna, Jesus, save me now. Will you pray with me? Bow down your head.